Well, hey, how we doing? Um, if we've never met, my name is Brandon, and uh, I'm usually over at the Hub, uh, making sure that things don't burn down, which is a terrible job for me. Um, but it's great to be over here and be able to spend some time with um, you all. And uh, I also help out with our groups team and, and work with our community groups, which, by the way, like Rooted, I think, I think has been going awesome. Has it been going good for you guys and your groups? Yeah, it's been incredible. Um, I know we just came out of our, uh, our prayer experience week, and I got a message from a, a group leader, and they, um, she just said that it was, they thought they prepared everything they could for it leading up, but they were still, people came in and they were like, uncomfortable, what's this gonna be like? Never prayed this long, we never prayed longer than 35 seconds, right? And uh, she said it was unbelievable. Like she said that it went awesome, and it was just really encouraging for our staff to be able um, to read that. But I think Rooted is, is forcing us into some conversations, into some practices, disciplines, you know, like journaling, hopefully, if you're trying that out for the first time, just doing things that maybe we've never done or um, we need to start doing. And I think it's also, um, we're covering some topics that we need to cover, some things like we talked about um, who is God, right? Just like some of us are like, I, I know that already, but there's some really good um, stuff in there that really gets you thinking. Who is God and um, how does God speak to us was the next one. And now today we're moving into um, a much more difficult conversation. Um, it's, it's one that I think uh, many of you, it might be the biggest hurdle of your life as far as like, hey, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can have faith in God. I don't know if I can do this because of this question. Or maybe some of you, you're kind of on your heels as followers of Christ saying, man, I just, I just don't know. This, this one thing, I just can't wrap my mind around it. And that question is this, and that's where is God in the midst of suffering? It's a huge question, huge question. And I think um, that if, you, if you think about our suffering, it really, it drives us either closer to God or further away from God. You know, we're in the rooted study. We're in this, this year, 2019. Our leadership is kind of set for us as this theme, this challenge to be more deeply rooted in our faith um, than we ever have before, especially as individuals, growing our re roots deep. And I would say that our response in the midst of suffering, like how we actually suffer, what we say, how we, what we do in the midst of our suffering, I would say that's a direct reflection of how deeply rooted uh, we actually are. That's a direct reflection of how mature we are in our faith. Do our root, how, root, how far um, deep do our roots go? And um, we're talking about real suffering. I'm not talking about just like a bad day at work or, you know, the Wi-Fi signals at one, at one bar and it's not, it's not fast enough. You know what I'm talking about? Or maybe you dropped the phone and, you know, broke the screen and you got to go pay that Apple Care $100, you know, deductible and it's the worst day ever. Um, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about real suffering. You know, my, my nine-year-old son, probably tonight, when we tell him there's no dessert, will we'll likely think that he's suffering. And, and Amber and I will chuckle about it a little bit because we'll think, you don't know what suffering is. You've never experienced suffering at all. But I'd say that some of your kids have. Some of your kids have experienced suffering. Some of them have walked alongside you through the worst of suffering. Some of you guys have suffered. And I was preparing this message, and I remember just pausing this week at my desk and just thinking about even just the ones that I know about, some of the things that you've had to walk through, the people that I know um, who attend our community at Rock Harbor here. And, and I'm just thinking through, like, some of you have lost kids, both young, not born yet. Some have lost them, you know, when they were older, just things that you cannot prepare for. Some of you have had family members tragically taken away from you, you know, whether it was an accident or a suicide. Some of you have had to walk, sit alongside your loved one while they were either terminally ill or, or just life was fading away, and you had to watch that and be part of that process. Some of you just broken, like, toxic relationships that you've been in. You've dealt with severe, crippling depression, anxiety, mental illness, and so this conversation today, it's, it's not an easy one. There are people here and at the Hub, and, and you're probably in pain right now. And the last thing that you want to hear is some dude stand on a stage talking about it. Like, it, it might feel too soon, like it's happening right now. It's not a conversation that maybe you want to have. But man, my, my prayer for you, if that's you, would just be that you'd be able to leave here today with some sort of comfort, some new measure of, of hope. And maybe, maybe even some joy, as hard as it is to, to think that that's even possible right now. So before we go on, I just want to pray for us, pray for that, and uh, pray that I get through this message. So, um, Lord, I just thank you for uh, who you are. Um, we're asking you some big questions today. 
and we invite you into that. Some of us are angry. Some of us are confused. Um, Lord, we just tell you that. We don't know. Um, and we want to just be led by you today. And whoever that person is that maybe this opens an old wound um, or maybe a wound is currently open, uh, Lord, I just pray that you would come alongside that person today. Um, just give them some peace and comfort today, Lord. Pray these things in your name. Amen. So God, where are you in the midst of suffering? Why do you let people suffer? Who, by a show of hands, be honest. Who has thought that? High, high up in the air. Look at that. You know, I think that if you look around, you see that, that you're not alone. Uh, when it comes to doubt, when it comes to things like this where we question God, uh, I don't think we like to talk about it, right? It, is, it makes us feel like we don't, you know, we're not a good Christian or we're not, um, we don't have enough faith. But it's a huge question, and it's a question that atheists have really used as their platform. Like, why would a good and loving God allow bad things to happen to good people, right? We've all thought it. We've all heard that. And it's interesting because I think that, um, we've, you know, if we ask that question, we realize when we see these hands that we're not alone. You know, people in the Bible have asked it. We think of King David, like the greatest king that ever lived on this earth. You know, this guy that the Bible talks about next to Jesus, other than Jesus, more than any other man in the Bible, this life that we see, King David, Israel's greatest king. He says, uh, all throughout Psalms, we see things like this. Psalm 22, uh, verse 1 through 2, David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if that sounds familiar and you've been reading any of the Gospels, you'll know that Jesus said that when he was hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus himself questioning. Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Or you think of Job. Who's read the book of Job? Like that stuff's messed up, right? Like that is a messed up story. Like the dude, okay, incredible man of faith, and, and Satan comes in and just, just wreaks havoc on his family, wreaks fat havoc on his life. All in a single day, his, his 10 kids, dead. His, all his livestock, he had a huge, huge herds of livestock, thousands of, of livestock, dead. All his servants, dead. And if that's not enough, then he gets, uh, he gets his whole body covered in boils, and it's like, dude, there's no country song that's depressing enough for this story, right? Like, you guys know what I'm talking about. But if that's not enough, and you keep going, and his friends turn into jerks, which there's a message in that for us, because he's sitting with his friends, and at first they come and they just sit with him, which is encouraging, and then they open their mouth, right? And sometimes we need to learn that, that we just need to be there. We just need to sit in the suffering with people. So they open their mouth, they become these huge jerks, and then his own wife says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Like, somebody probably needs to sign them up for a re-engage, if you could do that. Just write Job and wife. I don't remember her name. I know it's somewhere in there. But just sign them up. It's fine. We, we sign up people all the time without them knowing it's great for marriages. It's, uh, it's really good stuff. So, so that's what's going on. And then he, 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 he goes on, and we see in Job that he questions, like, God, where are you? Where are you? And it seems to me that God is okay with us asking this question. If it's asked throughout the whole Bible, I mean, you read through Psalms, and, you know, there's these sections of Psalms that they're called the, you know, Psalms of lament. People just lamenting, like, why? Why is this happening? You feel so far away. Why is this happening to me? But I think if we're going to ask this question, if we're going to ask, like, God, where are you in the midst of suffering? Oftentimes we just write them off before we even look for an answer. If we're going to, it's, it's kind of like if we're going to put God on the stand, we need to be willing to give him a fair trial. And the fair trial would be to get into the word and see where is he in the midst of all the suffering that's in the Bible. But what we do is we start to blame God. And when we blame, we all know this, it causes distance. It, it creates a distance between us and whoever we're blaming. Maybe it's your teacher, your spouse, you know, whatever that might be. We blame and it creates a distance. And, and funny, my notes, I promise, were finished well before last night, but God wanted me to have an illustration for this moment. So I was walking up the stairs last night. It was like 11 o'clock. My wife, Amber, was already in bed. And uh, on the stair railing, we have a nice little thing there that, you know, it gets filled with stuff, right? You guys have those spots too. And don't act like you don't. I know you do. You, we live in our houses, right? Um, and anyways, I walk up and there's uh, our two and a half year old son's bottle. He drinks a bottle of warm milk to for bed every day. Yeah, two and a half years old. Don't judge me. He's our fourth kid. We can do what we want, okay? So chill out. 
And so his bottle's sitting there. It's 11 o'clock. This bottle's been sitting out there for, you know, he's been in bed since 7.30 or 8. So you're looking at like three, four, three hours that it's been sitting there. And I walk into the bedroom. I'm like, Amber, are you just going to let that bottle rot all night? Like, that's gross. It's stinky. It's nasty. And, you know, what did she say? Can you rephrase that? It's like, can you rephrase that? But the moment that I came in there with that tone, with that kind of blame, it was kind of like this, it put an immediate wedge between us. And we do that with God. And when we do that, it puts a wedge between us and the one person, the one God who can actually help us in our suffering, the one who's equipped to help us. In this book, it's filled covers to cover with answers to this question. Like, honestly, when I was preparing this message, you guys, I was like, where do I start? Like, what story, what passage, what, what, what text can I live in for this message to talk about, like, where God is in the midst of suffering? It's easier if you said, Brandon, find me someone in the Bible who didn't suffer. Like, that, that would be harder to do, actually. Find me someone who didn't suffer. You know, we believe that this is the inspired word of God, and I have to remind myself that, you know, when, when, with all this suffering and pain that's going on, like, why would God put that all in this book? Like, why would he inspire this thing to be filled with uh, people suffering from, from really from the front to the back. Why would he do that? And I think he knew that we would have these questions and we would, need, we would need to be able to find the answers in order to find out where he's at in the midst of suffering. And I think what's interesting is if we think philosophically about it for just a second, which is, if you know me, is really hard to do because I'm not that smart. Um, I went to NNU and the philosophy class, they were like, is God so powerful that he can make a rock so big that he can't move it? And I'm like, don't care. So... <laughs> It's just not how my brain works. Um, but if we think about this kind of philosophically for a second, I think just, you know, why do we long for better? Like, why do we expect that there could be better? To me, just that, that longing or that expectation would show us that either in the past it was better or in the future that it is going to be better. I mean, someone wakes up blind or not wakes up blind, but maybe they're born blind and, and that's all they know in life. Like, that's all they've experienced. So they, that's all they know is those other senses. But we... We get born right into this broken world. We get born into all of the tragedy, all of the suffering, but we still have something in us that makes us think, like, something's wrong. And then what we do is we turn and we start to question. So we say, where are you, God, in the midst of suffering? And so number one in your program is that he's with you in it. We see this in the Bible. He's with you in it. You're not alone. You know, when I'm going through hard stuff and, and, and suffering, and I would say, honestly, like, the year 2018 was the year from hell for our family. If we look back through all the years, that, that was a, one of the hardest years for us. And, and, you know, I was telling Chris about this when we were talking about this message. Um, Chris Easley, our, our creative director, and he said, he said well, that was the year that you uh, met your deductible and your out-of-pocket maximum and all that, right? And it wasn't just little stuff. I mean, I'm talking like things that were, that were some big pills to swallow, some, some things that were like serious stuff that we had to work through. But in the midst of that, in the midst of that tragedy, what, do you know what I wanted? I wanted out. Do you know what God wants? He wants in. And that's what he wants for us. See, when we're in suffering, we're in tragedy, all we can think about is how do I get out of this? How do I, Lord, make this appointment come sooner? Make me get out of this. Why is this happening? And all we want is out. But God, he just wants in. He's with us in it, but we have to invite him in. You know, so we have these feelings of anger and frustration and fear, which are totally fine. Like, you can be angry at God, but you can't stay there. You can't stay there without moving on to see, like, what is promised to us. And one of those promises, I mean, if you want a promise, just open this book up and find a spot to start reading because it's going to be in there. I landed on Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, which many of you know. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, what about Psalms 23, verse 4? This would be one to memorize. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble in our time of trouble he's with you in it and sometimes I think the lowest most terrible moments are, are the moments that he wants to be the closest to us but we have to invite him in you know you look at the stories that if you did your reading this week Shadrach Meshach and Abednego um, you know Veggie Tales, Rackshack and Benny anybody remember those days 
Yeah, it's annoying, I know. Um, Rack, Shack, and Benny. So this great story of these guys, these incredible men of faith. You know, they come and the king says, hey, I'm going to throw you in this furnace if you don't bow down to me. And these guys say, we don't care. Like, we're, we're not going to bow down to you because God will save us. And then, he, and then what's awesome is they continue. They say, even if he doesn't save us, we're still not going to bow down to you. So this ticks off King Nebuchadnezzar, and he tells the guards, turn this fire up seven times the heat that it is. So now at this point, it's like hotter than grandma's house. Okay, see? I knew that would help you guys like, get a picture. Okay, how hot is this furnace? So they, the guards throw him in there, and it's so hot that the guards light on fire and they die. But then we keep reading, and you see that King Nebuchadnezzar is astonished. And this is what he says. I said, he says, I see four men unbound. Remember, three men went in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Like a son of the gods. He didn't say son of God. He said like a son of the gods. There was something different, something shiny about him. And many would call that a, a, what you call a Christophany. It's like a pre-incarnate um, uh, appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. And for all you like, Marvel nerds, you know, that's like Stan Lee showing up in all the Marvel movies, only like way, 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 way better. And I had to make sure I said way, way better because that would be like blasphemy, right? Because it's nothing like that. But God was with them in it, but he also saved them through it. You know, in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, there's a similar story where uh, the, the king made this decree where you can't pay, pray to any other gods, but Daniel continued to pray to God instead of to the king. And so they put him in the lion's den and they sealed it shut, and God was with him in it. He saved him through it. Even Jesus, the night before he was trade, betrayed, he said, God, is there any other way? God, is there any other way? This is Jesus, again, questioning but God didn't save him from the cross. He saved him through the cross. And more importantly, he saved you through the cross. You look at the story of Lazarus. Like, Jesus didn't save him in death. The dude was totally dead. I mean, we're talking like done, gone, totally gone. And, and he saved him in death. He saved him through death, and he brought him back to life. And I think that a practice we need as people, as Christians, is to be able to rehearse God's faithfulness to ourselves and to him. You know, some of you, you rehearse like positive self-talk and, you know, all these things that you can, I can do this, I can do that. Well, this is something that we, re, we need to rehearse. If you look at our lives, I think sometimes we look at a, like a snapshot of what's going on in our lives. We look at like this Insta story or this Facebook story moment, right? Like a day or maybe three days of what's going on in our life. And we think, why is this happening to me? Like, get me out of this. But then we look at this span of 10 years and we can look back. And we can say, like, yeah, I didn't understand why this happened. Yeah, I don't know why I was going through this. No, I did not like it. But I can look back after 10 years of this life or 20 years or whatever it might be, and I can say that God was faithful, God is faithful, and God will forever be faithful. I'd say there's probably some people in this room who you've got, you're like time-tested faith where you can look back, you're agreeing with me right now, even thinking about it, like you can look back 20, 30, 40 years of just the worst moments of your life, but look back and say, man, God is faithful. And he will be faithful. He's in it with you. That's why Isaiah says, in Isaiah 41, uh, chapter 41, verse 10, he says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not, for I am with you. He's with you in it. And God didn't write all this stuff for nothing. He didn't put all of this suffering in here for nothing. He put it in there so that we would know how to answer, like, God, where are you in the midst of suffering? The second one is that he's at work through it. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that, those, that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. It doesn't say that, and we know that for those who love God, good things work together for good. It says all things work together for good. And that means the bad, the painful, the painful stuff, the suffering stuff, all of that stuff will work together for good. And that's so hard to hear when you're in the middle of it because there's nothing good about it. There's nothing good about what's happening right now, but it will work together for good. Say so if you're in it right now, that'd be a verse that's worth memorizing, and we have to realize that even when we're hurting, God is still working. Even when you're hurting, God is still working, 
Even when it doesn't feel like it, God is so strong, he's so powerful, and he's so good that he can take our mess and he can turn it into a masterpiece. I think you've heard us say that before. He can take a mess and turn it into a masterpiece where if you've ever been to like an old Catholic church or whatever that, that might be to, where they have stained glass windows, if you look up close to it, it looks like this broken glass and you can't hardly see through it, but you stand back and you see what God's done. You've seen this masterpiece, and that's why people can look back 20 years ago and say, man, that was a mess. But Lord, you made it into a masterpiece. You were so faithful. So faithful. You know, suffering, it comes to every single one of us, and we don't, we don't get to control it. We don't get to have any say in it. We try to prevent it. But we need to know that it's never wasted. For those that follow Jesus, it says right here, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who follow God, for those who are followers of Christ, your pain is never wasted. God is a specialist in recycling our pain. Think about that. God is a specialist in recycling our pain. And I'll show you what I mean by that. In Romans chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, Paul says, Through him we, also have, we have also attained access to faith, or by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in, su- in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So that's how it's, it's recycled. God takes our suffering and he recycles it and turns it into endurance. And he takes endurance and he recycles it and turns it into character. And then he takes that character and he, retur- and, he, and he creates hope out of it. And that's what we need. The hope is what sustains us in our suffering. I'm going to talk a little bit more about hope in just a couple minutes. But I want you to meet um, a couple in our church who, incredible couple. They're the Tanners. And um, they've got a story that they've dealt with exactly the things that we're talking about today and we caught them up with this week we caught up with them this week so we could show you their story and i'm philip we first met in phoenix arizona at grand canyon university uh, she was going to study accounting and i was there to study sports management uh, we dated for uh, two years at school we became really serious really fast um, which was yeah something that we both didn't really expect and we knew that we were going to get married right away so we um, decided to take summer classes so we could get married sooner so we cut off a year of schooling and i think god made that happen for a reason because he knew that i would need his help in the near future <laughs> september 26th um, it was a tuesday just a regular day got ready for work going down my car, got my car, felt super dizzy, super lightheaded. And I'm pretty tough and I just try to ignore it, but God just really spoke to me. And he was just like, get out of the car, you need, you need help. So I called Philip, who was thankfully still at home at the time. He helped me out of the car and he helped me get to the curb. And that's when I passed out. I didn't know what to do, so I called the ambulance and luckily they came and when they, when they came, she had woken up. Um, she was still feeling really sick and everything. She didn't really know what had happened. Got her into the ambulance and they had me drive uh, behind them to the hospital. At that time I called her parents and just told them, hey, Jessica's in the hospital. I think she's just dehydrated. It was summer in Phoenix, 110 degrees outside probably. And then when I got to the hospital, I was just waiting in the lobby. They, they pulled me back and they looked worried. And um, they're like, it's worse than what you thought. And they're like, she's having CPR done on her right now. And at that time, I was just, I didn't know what to do or what to say. I was just in shock. And they took me back to her room when they were doing CPR. And they were like, they explained to me what was going on, um, that she didn't have a pulse. And that they think it was blood clots in her lungs. All the nurses in there, there's 10, 15 nurses and doctors in there switching off doing CPR. And they, I could tell they're just looking at me like, this is horrible. Why is this happening? The main part of it started like three days later when they were able to do a CT scan on me and they pulled my parents in for a meeting and they told us that the CT scan showed no brain activity and they pronounced me um, brain dead. That, that time I was just angry with God. I was like, why would he do this? Um, I always heard, I've always been told growing up in a Christian home, like God does everything for a reason. I'm like, what is the reason for this? Um, there's clearly nothing good that can come out of this, I thought. At this point, 
the story pretty much went viral. And so there was all those people there and we were getting messages from people in like China and Australia, Australia and stuff, yeah. from like YWAM groups that were praying for me. And I remember later thinking like, how the heck did people in Australia hear about this? And yeah. it was all over Facebook and there's hundreds and hundreds of people praying for me that night. And they did the MRI and the doctor called all of our parents in and we just we were thinking the worst because they told us yeah the, the CT scan showed this there's very little like evidence that the MRI will show anything different we just need to do it to basically prove like show that the CT scan was right and the doctor came in and said the MRI looked pretty good and we're like what does that mean like pretty good like she's gonna like she's gonna live like another week or pretty good she's gonna be able to wake up and be her normal self my talks with God changed. It was more of praising Him at that time than the anger. Um, I just was so happy that He was giving me a little more time with her. I didn't know how long, but He just gave me <laughs> um, Basically, the doctor explained it to us that, yes, yeah, she has a like a 2% chance of living, but she'll probably be in this hospital for the next year. Then she started gradually waking up. I know most of the time in the movies we see someone waking up from a coma. It's just like they wake up and they're just like, oh, hey. This was not the case in hers. Um, she just gradually woke up over a few days. But at that time, I was actually completely blind when I woke up. So a lot of the time I was just hallucinating things. So I didn't, couldn't really discern reality from thinking I was still in a dream. Waking up, I remember looking over and seeing my dad and he told me what happened. He told me, you know, you had blood clots in your lungs and it stopped your heart and you're there doing CPR for 90 minutes and you shouldn't be alive. God saved you. It was like hearing a story that was happening to someone else. I was really scared that first day, but then God just covered me with a supernatural grace and peace. I would never really freaked out or got upset or cried. I just knew that if God rose me from the dead, literally, that all this other stuff would be no problem. I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat, I couldn't walk. And I just, God just gave me this peace. so many people that were just touched by my story and that there was people that their own faith was renewed just hearing our story and how we walked through it and to me that's just worth it to know that there was my story um, was able to impact other people and grow them closer to God as well. Obviously we wouldn't wish this kind of suffering on anyone um, but if you are going through some some kind of suffering today just know that uh, God is going to be with you uh, through it all, um, no matter the outcome, no matter the situation. I know that Keith talks a lot about how God's always with us through our suffering. He's not watching from behind or watching from in front of us. He's right there next to us. And I really felt that during the time I was in the hospital, just this overwhelming just peace and comfort from God. And I just know that he was right there next to me and that there was nothing to fear during that time because I knew that he would just take care of me. happened two years ago. They were newlyweds, two and a half months in, and then tragedy hits. No plan for that. You obviously can't expect that. And then here she is seconds, like literally seconds away from death. She said that they would get a pulse and then it would go away and they'd have to keep doing CPR. And my wife's a, a nurse and I said, what is, you know, what do you think 90 minutes? She's like, that's insane. Like her brain should not be functioning cut off from oxygen for that long. Zero brain activity, two weeks in a coma. She wakes up fully blind, couldn't walk, couldn't eat. And yet, look at these pictures. A 
Like, what do you notice about these pictures? Yeah, she's smiling. And I'm sitting here behind these cameras of this video, and I'm sitting here like, like, what? Like, how, did, how are you not, like, depressed right now? Like, your life has been significantly altered. It's never going to be the same. And at one point, Chris and I are just trying to figure this out. We're just drilling her with questions. Like, and one of my questions was, are you, do you feel like you're still suffering? Like, I, I, from my perspective, it seems like you're still suffering. And she said, well, it, it stinks to not be able to read anymore. But my phone, you know, the screen, it reads me everything that's on the screen. And she said, I've read or listened to 40 books this year on Audi, Aud, Audible. She said, so that's cool. And she said, I don't really care that much about driving, so I don't feel like that was a huge loss. But she can never work again. At one point she said that she can't see the toilets well enough to clean them, so that's on Philip. She's got the most incredible sense of humor and this joy, this unexplainable joy and peace they have. That Even I'm sitting there and I'm like, how, how in the world are you doing this? And I think you guys are probably sitting there too with that same perspective, like you're still suffering. But I think the reason that she's able to do that, the reason that they're able to sit here and talk about it like this is that someone else was in the fire with them. And we can't explain it because we don't get to look in like King Nebuchadnezzar and see a a, a physical body of that fourth person in the fire, but we know something's different. We know something is off. Like this is not a normal way to suffer. I don't know about you guys, but I want to have joy like Jessica. I feel like it's important that we acknowledge right now that there's some of you either here at the hub or, or watching online, and you watch this and you thought, man, that's, that's a really incredible story. Like, what a miracle. But mine didn't end that way. Like, they never made it. They never recovered. There was no miracle. And maybe you're still saying, God, where are you? Where were you? And I want to encourage you today and say that the outcome should never change our response. The outcome of what happens in our suffering, the outcome of whatever that is, it doesn't change these promises that are still in the Bible. There's over 300 prophecies that have come to pass. Over 300 prophecies that have come true from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I say that, I say that to myself because it helps me to, to know and believe that the promises that have not yet come true are going to come to pass. And we have to hold on to that. One of those, one of those promises is from Revelation chapter 24 or 21, verses 1 through 4. And I want to read that to you. Listen to this very closely if you're in it right now or you've got some open wounds. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And listen to this part. It says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall be their mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, and that is the hope. That's what our hope is in. And that's why Paul, who has suffered probably close to, like next to Jesus, has suffered more than anybody. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, he says, This is light and momentary affliction that is preparing us for the weight of eternal glory that is beyond all comparison. How can a guy like that, who's gone through what he's gone through, it's because he sees that there's more ahead, there's something better. And we have to hold on to that. We've never ever been promised that that life would be easy. In fact, Jesus says in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's the God that we serve the one who's in it with us and the one that's at work through it and the one who was faithful and the one who is faithful and the one who will be faithful. 
And that brings me to my last point, that when we're suffering, we have two options. We can either invite him in or we can blame him out. We can either invite him in or we can blame him out. It's plain and simple. Philip and Jessica, they invited him in. That's what it looks like. And their pain and suffering, is, it's, not for not, it's not for anything. It's not for not. We're literally sitting in these seats on this front row, these front row seats watching God recycle their pain. Like we're watching it be used. Some of you, you're gonna walk out of here encouraged by what you saw. Countless others online and, and at the hub and all of that. Like God is recycling their pain. And I don't know if you caught what she said, but she said it's worth it. How can anybody say that all of that is worth it, that a life completely altered is worth it? because someone else is in the fire with her. And she's invited him in. In just a minute, we're gonna sing a song here and at the hub as well. And I want you just to consider that if you're suffering right now, are you gonna invite him in or are you gonna blame him out? Or maybe you suffered before and you went through something and you blamed him out and you're realizing like, I can't do this anymore. Then you wanna invite him back in. Maybe you've never invited him in and, and you're just like, I can't suffer alone anymore and I went through some tragedy by myself and I didn't have access to that. I didn't know what that meant. Well, the Bible says just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. It's so simple. I wanna read you a verse and then we're gonna stand going to sing together. And the, the verse is James 5, 13. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any among you happy, joyful? Let him sing. So if you need to pray today and during this song, then pray. If you need to sing and things are going well right now, then sing. But take this message, take these truths that we learned today and realize that, that suffering could happen at any moment, whether you've gone through something or not, and don't minimize what you've gone through and compare it to what someone else has gone through. Are you gonna invite him in or blame him out? Let's go ahead and sing.